really excited when this guy contacted us to uh, potentially put on a program for us. And uh, he's no stranger. I'm sure every single one of you on this call today has a clue who our speaker is, but uh, he's coming to talk about maybe a slightly different subject than what we would have maybe thought of. And that's Mr. Dan Taylor. He was on ABC 30 for years. Um, when you talk about, I mean, Dan, I don't know if I'm going too far here, but uh, you know, as, as I think back to being a kid, I mean, my gosh, you talk about the legends of uh, Fresno here that was on TV. And I think of, you know, I think of uh, yourself, Bob Long, Angela Stallis, those guys that were really the uh, stalwarts of, uh, you know, helping build this area and uh, really, really being those trusted voices of folks that uh, brought us the news on a nightly basis there. So, so excited to have him today. Today, Dan is the author of The Rise of the Bulldogs, a Scouts Report, uh, My 70 Years in Baseball, Fates Takeout Slide in collaboration with George uh, Genovese. And Taylor is a member of the Society for American Baseball Research and the Pacific Coast League Historical Society. And he still resides in Fresno, California. So with that said, Dan, thank you so much for joining us today. Super excited about this presentation. Ryan, thanks. It's good to see you. Good to see some friends I haven't had the chance to see in a while. Diane, Gordy, a few others. So uh, uh, this is fun. And with the Grizzlies right around the corner, uh, get you in the mood for baseball and, and talking a little bit of baseball. It's as big a treat for me to talk about uh, uh, the Hollywood stars as it has been over the last few years to research and to write uh, this book, Lights, Camera, Fastball, How the Hollywood Stars Changed Baseball. Just who were the Hollywood stars? Well, the Hollywood stars were a minor league baseball team from 1938 through 1957. They played in the Pacific Coast League. And the Hollywood stars were a phenomenon. They were, they were the glamour team of baseball. There's never been anything like it in the game. Uh, they were the team of the movie stars, as their name suggests. They really were the, the Hollywood stars for Hollywood stars. Uh, every night, the ballpark, uh, the box seats especially, were filled with the biggest names in, in the motion picture and entertainment industry, from Groucho and Harpo Marx and their families sitting by the dugout to Jimmy Stewart and Bing Crosby and uh, you name it. They were all over the ballpark. And, and I think as players joined that team, uh, what they were amazed by, uh, the many that told me about it, uh, was that they found out that these great big Hollywood celebrities were as big a fans as them, of them as, as they were of the movie stars. And, and these movie stars were not just uh, ticket buying fans. They were very, very involved in the ball club. Uh, Jimmy Stewart and his wife would have players into their home for dinner. Uh, Bing Crosby would take players out golfing. Uh, Gail Patrick and her husband would uh, have pool parties and barbecues on the team's off days on Monday. So they were very active and very involved uh, uh, with the ball players and were just huge fans. Uh, and they were deeply involved with the ball club as well. There were a number of uh, the biggest names in Hollywood that were investors in the ball club. If you attended a Hollywood Stars game on bat day, well, there was a good chance your bat might be handed to you by Gary Cooper or Barbara Stanwyck or even Bing Crosby. And I think my wife, uh, when she talks about hoping one day there's time travel, I think that's a day she wants to go back to. But uh, it, it was a remarkable uh, environment, a remarkable uh, uh, opportunity in, in baseball. And uh, one thing, though, I feel like, and in the research I did for this book that I, I came away strongly believing is that that reputation the Hollywood stars carry as being the team of the celebrities overshadowed what their real reputation should be. And that's as maybe the most innovative team that baseball's ever seen. As an example, the Hollywood stars were the first minor league team. And actually outside of the Brooklyn Dodgers and New York Giants, they were the very first, the third team in baseball history to put their games on television. Opening day of the 1940 season, the Stars televised their game, and there were only 300 sets in Los Angeles at that time, and it was still an experimental medium. Uh, there was a, a store in Long Beach where the, the store owner put a, a television set in the window, and, and such a large crowd gathered to watch the game that it spilled out into the streets and, and blocked traffic, and the police had to be called to break it up. Ultimately, Hollywood, after the war, when television grew, uh, the stars televised all of their home games on local television in Los Angeles. And, and there was a bit of controversy about that as well. The Hollywood stars were the first team to fly. Uh, baseball, particularly the major league teams, frowned on putting their ball clubs on planes. They were the American League and National League presidents feared that an accident would wipe out an entire ball club. And they, they encouraged the major league teams not to fly. But uh, Hollywood, while the minor league clubs were on buses or trains or even in station wagons, the Hollywood stars weren't only flying to Seattle or Portland 
or San Francisco or Oakland, they were flying by charter. Uh, so it was a really unique situation. Of course, on opening day uh, in 1950, the Hollywood stars shocked baseball with a new uniform as they uh, trotted out uh, short pants. And rather than a flannel jersey, they wore T-shirts. And the story behind that, a columnist in the Los Angeles Times had, had prodded the team to do something creative with their uniforms. And Fred Haney was the manager at that time, and he pounced on that idea. Haney thought, well, if soccer teams can play in, in shorts, why not baseball? And uh, he sold it to his players who were not happy about it. In fact, uh, I talked to a few of the guys who, who were on that team, and they, they said there was a lot of anger in the clubhouse when the boxes were broken open and they were shown their new uniform. And I talked to the bat boy on the team that day, and I asked him who in particular was the most upset. And he said, well, that's easy. It was the guys with the really ugly legs. But uh, the Stars wore these, these uniforms for two and a half seasons, and Haney sold it to his players on the idea that it would make them faster. It was a lighter uniform. And Haney would coach first base, and Chuck Stevens was the first batter that day for the Stars. And, and ironically, he beat out an infield hit. And as soon as he crossed first base and the umpire hollered safe, Fred Haney turned to the stands and raised his arms and hollered, see, I told you, they work. But his players, they didn't like it because Haney employed a running game. He liked to steal. He liked to hit and run. He liked to squeeze, which meant a lot of sliding. And uh, his ball players were really upset because their legs were getting chewed up. And uh, finally, after two and a half seasons, Haney agreed and, and they shelved the shorts. One of the things we see at the major league level and many levels of the minor leagues now is uh, unique food items being brought out uh, for fan enjoyment. And the Hollywood Stars started this many, many years ago. It was uh, kind of an interesting trend, although on a much smaller scale than, than what we see now. I mean, one of their first seasons, they introduced uh, hot, fresh roasted peanuts with a, a prize in every bag. And then the next year, they came out with uh, mini donuts that were made fresh to order. And then ultimately, the, the, one of their, uh, their great ideas, I say that facetiously, with the, the electrocuted frankfurter. And I don't think I want to go there, <laughs> but, but they were always uh, coming up with new and unique ideas. And where did it all come from? Well, it came from the top and a guy who has probably touched your life and, and you don't even realize it. The man's name was Bob Cobb and Bob Cobb was the owner at that time, the owner and operator of the most celebrated restaurant in the world. The Brown Derby in Hollywood it was a Mecca for the celebrities. It was down the street from the radio and motion picture studios. How did Bob Cobb touch your life? Well, he is the creator of the Cobb salad. Bob Cobb was an avid sportsman, uh, grew up in Montana, uh, loved to hunt and fish, competed uh, in the National Trap and Skeet Shooting Championships, loved to come up here into the valley and, uh, and go hunting on ranches in the area with friends. And his restaurant, as I mentioned, was a mecca for the movie stars, and he involved those movie stars. I mean, he would serve as specials, some of the, their own recipe uh, meals. Uh, if they had farms, he, he would sometimes buy their produce or their fish off of their farm. And so he involved them, and he took that to the ball club. In November of 1938, he had the opportunity to buy the Hollywood stars. They had just completed their first year in Los Angeles and failed miserably. The owner was broke. It was a distress sale. They didn't draw very well at all. They didn't win many games in 1938. So when Cobb was presented the opportunity, he jumped at it, got on the phone and immediately called a number of his uh, celebrity friends. Cecil B. DeMille, the legendary director, was the first guy that he called. Bing Crosby, Gene Autry, and in time he had about 18 of these celebrities together and they created a, a, an ownership group. And they raised $200,000, 40,000 bought the ball club. Diane Carberry is probably sitting there saying, gosh, if only a Coast League team still went for that price. But uh, 50,000 was set aside to improve the ball club and buy new players. And 100,000, and Diane's gonna cringe when she hears this figure as well, but 100,000 went to pay for half of the cost to construct their ballpark. They teamed with Earl Gilmore, an oil man and, and property developer in Southern California. The family still owns the farmer's market down there in, in uh, Los Angeles. And Earl Gilmore had 200 acres of land. And so they went to him and, and struck a deal to build their ballpark on that land, Gilmore Field. And uh, the site is now where CBS Television City now stands, right next to the farmer's market and, and the Grove, the popular shopping area. 
But when I say Bob Cobb brought many of the philosophies that he employed to the restaurant, to the ballpark, he was really, it was about quality. He was about people. He was about cleanliness. He had a, an army of, of staff that would circulate the ballpark inside and out during games. And, and they would uh, sweep up the uh, dropped papers and uh, uh, cups and cigarette butts and whatnot. And I've often wondered because one of the original box seat owners at Gilmore Field was Walt Disney. And we see that practice employed at his theme parks. And I've often wondered if maybe that's where Walt Disney got the idea. But Cobb was, he was all about quality. When he built the ballpark, uh, he had the celebrities in mind and he knew that celebrities, if they weren't happy, they wouldn't complain. They simply would never come back. So we had a VIP lounge constructed in Gilmore Field, and we're talking decades before the Lakers created their uh, VIP lounge during their showtime years at the Forum. Uh, but at Gilmore Field, Bob Cobb's VIP lounge had a, a live orchestra playing. They had a buffet meal, open bar, and it was just for the, the celebrities that they could go into before and after a game. Uh, the box seats that he constructed at Gilmore Field had backing and sides and were much closer to what was offered at the Hollywood Bowl or Hollywood Park Racetrack than what we would normally see at a ballpark. And in terms of food items, well, he clashed with his food service people who were all about buying low and, and selling high. Cobb had, as a fan, gone to LA Angels games across town at Wrigley Field, and, and he'd been appalled by the, the ballpark food. And he called the peanuts there sleazy and, and, and criticized the, the hot dog buns as being paper mache. And so when he took over the stars, he was all about uh, quality and down to the, the type of fat content that he wanted in the ice cream and and wanting real milk buns and he was a stickler uh, for quality uh, we see today I, I think it's easy to say there, there are three things that uh, uh, still have the the handprint of bob cobb on them in uh, professional baseball the first uh, the league the grizzlies will be in it's been known for 79 years as the california league changes come to baseball so i think it's uh, a low a west now but uh uh, the Hollywood stars created the California League uh, 80 years ago. They wanted to get into developing their own talent. They got together with the owners of the other five California-based Pacific Coast League clubs and created a minor league, the California League. And it was specifically initially in 1941 for the development of players for those Pacific Coast League teams. It went on hiatus during World War II. And when it came back, major league teams came in, made better offers and, and were able to snap up those affiliations away from the Coast League teams. Uh, the other thing that we see on a nightly basis at professional baseball and, and the Fresno Grizzlies have done a phenomenal job of showcasing this. It's the, the mid game break where the grounds crew comes out and grooms the infield. And I don't think any team in baseball has done a better job of turning that into a part of their entertainment offering than the Grizzlies with the drag Kings. But that was started by the Hollywood stars in 1950. They had a pitcher by the name of Jack Salveson. He was a former major league pitcher and he was near the end of his career. And he knew that to have any kind of success at all, he was going to have to keep hitters off balance. So to do that, he worked fast. He would tell his catcher, as soon as you've released the ball to me, get back down in the crouch because the next pitch is coming. Well, working fast meant shorter ball games by 30 minutes sometimes or more. And shorter ball games meant the Hollywood stars didn't make as much money on the sale of food and beverage. So Cobb and company were racking their brains trying to think of a, a, a solution to combat this problem. And they came up with the idea of creating a 10 minute mid game intermission and having the grounds crew come out and groom the infield. Well, they took it to the Pacific Coast League and they were shot down. They then went to the minor league baseball and they were shot down there too. They took it to the rules committee, which agreed to let them experiment for the remainder of the season. And by the 1951 season, Everybody in the game was doing it and has been doing it ever since. The final thing that, that uh, I think has the handprints of the Hollywood stars all over it, and specifically Bob Cobb, and it may shock you, that's Dodger Stadium. In 1952, uh, Bob Cobb was looking to build a new ballpark. After the war in 1946, the Pacific Coast League made the first of three attempts to get into the major leagues. They wanted to be the third major league to gain major league status alongside the American League and the National League. And when Ford Frick became the commissioner, he laid out criteria. And the, the Pacific Coast League, and, and Frick said, I'm not going to take one or two teams as an expansion. It'll be an entire league if we expand it all. And uh, the one area where the Pacific Coast League fell short was the quality of their stadiums. 
Wrigley Field in LA met major league specifications. Seal Stadium in San Francisco was close, but was going to need some work. None of the others came close. Well, Cobb one afternoon was invited to the police academy by the chief of police for a meeting. And after the meeting, he walked around up there in Chavez Ravine and was immediately struck that he felt this was the perfect place to build a ballpark. He engaged a, a renowned architect, Stiles O. Clements from Pasadena, and they put together what they called a, a blueprint for a super modern ballpark. And this park had, it was way ahead of its time. It had two restaurants, it had a cocktail lounge, childcare, escalators coming up from the parking areas. And it had a, a unique feature that no park or arena anywhere in the country had at that time. They called them cabanas, which we now know today as suites, which are a staple of every stadium and arena. Cobb took the idea to the city. They weren't convinced that the Pacific Coast League had a chance to gain major league status, and they really weren't excited about the, the proposal. He went to the county, and the county liked the idea, but they wanted to do it someplace else, and that was a no-go with Cobb. He kept pushing and pushing, but wasn't getting anywhere with the city. And ultimately, when the, when the Philadelphia Athletics were sold and moved to Kansas City, there had been men in Los Angeles vowing that they were going to buy that team and bring it to LA. And when they failed, and the word came from people within baseball that the reason they failed was LA didn't have a ballpark plan, the mayor took a lot of heat. So he held a press conference, and at this press conference, he announced that he had a plan for a ballpark for Los Angeles, and he held up a drawing. It was Bob Cobb's drawing. So Cobb was fighting an uphill battle from that day on. In 1957, when Walter O'Malley made his fact-finding visit to Los Angeles, he told all the city leaders he wasn't going to meet with any of them until he met first with Bob Cobb. Not long after Mr. O'Malley touched down in Los Angeles, Cobb and O'Malley had a meeting, a two-hour meeting in Mr. O'Malley's suite at the old Stadler Hilton, and Cobb laid out the drawings, the blueprints, maps of the area, pointing out that one day three freeways would service that Chavez Ravine area. Cobb left the meeting sold. And he told all the city leaders he, he met with over the next couple of days that his ballpark had to be in Chavez Ravine. And some tried to get him to move into Wrigley Field, the Angels old ballpark. That was a non-starter with Mr. O'Malley. There were others that wanted him to try and make the Coliseum a permanent home. And he pointed out that that was just not, not viable at all. He stuck to his guns. It had to be Chavez Ravine or nothing. And ultimately the city agreed with him and we've had Dodger Stadium ever since. When the Dodgers moved west, that meant the end. And of course, the Giants as well uh, forced out the Seals and the Oakland Oaks in the Bay Area. And uh, the Angels and the Hollywood Stars had to leave Southern California because Major League Baseball had moved in. The Stars looked uh, seriously at a, an opportunity to move down the road to Long Beach, but that was shot down. And the ball club ultimately was sold and moved to Salt Lake City. A lot of people in the media in Southern California urged Walter O'Malley to give Bob Cobb a, a, a place within the Dodger hierarchy, but Cobb said, I've had my fun in baseball, and I've just got to focus my attention now on my chili parlor. And uh, his as his grandson told me uh, throughout the years before Mr. Cobb's passing, that there were two words that family members were not allowed to speak in the Cobb household, Walter O'Malley. And he elaborated that it wasn't from his grandfather, it was from his grandmother that she had so much fun being around the Hollywood stars environment. And, and she just never forgave Walter O'Malley for bringing big league baseball to Los Angeles. Maybe one of the few that felt that way. So it's a remarkable story. It was a treat for me to be able to research and, and bring this story out. And I've had a lot of fun in the, the last few weeks, uh, hearing from family members and former players and their thoughts and reminiscing. And uh, it's really been a treat. So I appreciate the chance to share that with all of you. And I'm certainly open to comments, thoughts, or questions that you may have. Thank you, Dan. That was terrific. Uh, yeah, actually, you got one here that I'll start out with. Um, 